Section 13 of The Ring and the Book, an Interpretation, by Francis Bickford Hornbrook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13. The Book and the Ring. The Book and the Ring is a fulfilment of the promise of the poet in the first book, that, after he has led his readers to the summit from which the wide prospect round may be seen, he will lead them back to Mother Earth. He has made the voices speak again, as once they spoke while excitement was at its highest, and while all hearts were revealing their inmost thought and motive. Now he ends with the recital of the gossip and chatter of the street. What we have in the book and the ring is the commonplace of contemporary life. The story is, practically, at an end, with the death of Guido, the chief actor in it. What had once filled the vision of men and women had fallen and faded from their view. What was once seen grows what is now described, then talked of, told about, a tinge the less in every fresh transmission, till it melts, trickles in silent orange or wan grey across our memory, dies and leaves all dark, and presently we find the stars again. After February the 22nd, 1698, the poet gives four reports concerning those the days killed or let live. The first is a letter of a Venetian gentleman, then in the city of Rome, from which we learn how the decision of the Pope was viewed by the people of consideration there. The visitor explains that the Pope is tottering on the verge of the grave, and that men are betting on his probable successor. He seemed to be doing very well while he could go out of doors and saunter by the river, but confinement within doors, on account of the rain, caused fainting fits which only his determination to hold a jubilee a second time enables him to overcome. Guido, until within two days, had seemed safe. Everyone in Rome was in his favour. But the prejudices of the Pope, his passion for France, got the better of him, and he persisted in the butchery. He seemed to be moved by his regard for the mob, and rebuffed Martinez, who came to plead for Guido's pardon. More than all this, he ordered the execution to take place where it could be seen by all. Two old friends of Guido, Acciaioli and Panciatichi, had been with him during his last hours, to dispose him for ending well and had been perfectly successful in their endeavour. Guido appeared in his car, so intrepid and nonchalant, that all had admired him. As the procession moved on, a car ran over a man and killed him, and bitter were the outcries of the mob against the Pope. A beggar, lame from birth, recovered the use of his leg through prayer of Guido as he glanced that way. At the scaffold, after the hanging of the four peasants, which was hardly noticed, Guido harangued the multitude, begged forgiveness on the part of God and fair construction of his act from men, whose suffrage he entreated for his soul, suggesting that we should forthwith repeat a pater and an ave with the hymn Salve Regina Celi for his sake, which said he turned to the confessor crossed and reconciled himself with decency, then rose up, as brisk knelt down again, bent head, adapted neck, and, with the name of Jesus on his lips, received the fatal blow. When the headsman showed his head to the populace, strangers were much disappointed, because he was not as tall as he had been reported to be, and his face was not one to please a wife. His friends said his unpleasing appearance was due to his costume. He wore the dress he did the murder in. A second report appears in the letter of Don Giacinto Arcangeli, the advocate who defended Guido, to a fellow advocate at Florence, in which he informs him that he had almost succeeded in securing a reprieve for Guido. It is to this advocate, Cencini, that we owe the book out of which the ring of poetry was made. In his letter, Archangeli tells his correspondent that his justificative points 
had arrived too late to benefit his client, now with God. The court had decided, in spite of all his pleas, against him, and as the Pope had judged it expedient to dispense with Guido's plea of privilege, he had been executed with his four companions. However, he had commiseration and respect in his decease from universal Rome, the nice and cultivated everywhere. The result, Archangeli feels, must be due to his inability to set the valid reasons forth. On the next leaf, he bids his friend show to others what he had just written on the other side, but to keep what he now says for himself. Cencini's pleas had come too late, but, after all, nothing would have availed against the wish of an old man to see one younger than himself die before him. His superb defence of Guido would remain, while ineptitude and obstinacy would go with the Pope to the tomb. Besides, all will understand and stigmatise the motives which led him to change the place of execution. He must now turn to another case, but before the mail goes, he must say that his boy, godson of Cencini, had enjoyed the sight of the execution. He relates with gusto the reply which his son had made to a lady who twitted him with the remark that his father's eloquence could not be depended upon, as heretofore, for help. He finally comforts himself with the assurance that the Pope thinks that his was the real victory, if learning and eloquence could avail to gainsay fact. A letter of Bettinius, the advocate of Pompilia, follows. He has gained his case and made truth triumph, but he is dissatisfied. He complains that, as usual, he had the plain truth to plead. Guido, like the poltroon he was, had fully confessed his crime, and there was really the end of the matter. His rival can triumph in the fact that in spite of all difficulties, he nearly succeeded in getting his client off free. This he knew Archangeli and Rome would say. I looked that Rome should have the natural gird and advocate with case that proves itself. I knew Archangeli would grin and brag. But what say you to one impertinence might move a stone? That monk, you are to know, that barefoot Augustinian, whose report of the dying woman's words did detriment to my best points it took the freshness from, that meddler preached to purpose yesterday at San Lorenzo as a winding up of the show which proved a treasure to the church. Out comes his sermon, smoking from the press. Its text, Let God be true, and every man a liar. And its application, this, the longest winded of the paragraphs, I straight unstitch, tear out, and treat you with. In this sermon, the impertinent monk declared that the case of Pompilia was by no means an illustration of the truth that innocence always prevails. Many, as innocent as she, had not been plucked from the world's calumny. So it might have been with Pompilia, and so, for a time, it was, had not events proved and proclaimed her a pure white soul. Even law, appointed to defend the just, failed to discern her character, and, if allowed, would have caused her to be classed among the vilest of her kind. It was only the true instinct of an old good man which had seen and proclaimed what she really was. All this, he declares, demonstrates the worthlessness of human fame. The sermon provokes Bertinius very much, and he exclaims, Didst ever touch such ampulosity as the monk's own bubble, let alone its spite? His sermon itself was made for the fame which he professed to flout. As for Pompilia, about whom the preacher boasted, he will show what law can do for her. The monastery of the Convertites is entitled to the estate of every sinner who dies in its care. Now Pompilia was in its care, and therefore a sinner. And although the court declared Guido guilty, I did not pronounce her innocent. Bottinius, as attorney for the monastery, or bring suit against her as a person of dishonest life, and asks his correspondent to send him the judgment of the court at Arezzo, clenched again by the Grand Ducal signature, wherein Pompilia is convicted, 
doomed, and only destined to escape through flight the proper punishment. Send me the peace, I'll work it. And this foul-mouthed friar shall find his Noah's dove that brought the olive back turn into quite the other sooty scout, the raven, Noah first put forth the ark, which never came back but ate carcasses. No adequate machinery in law? No power of life and death i' the learned tongue? Methinks I am already at my speech. Startle the world with, Thou, Pompilia, thus? How is the fine gold of the temple dim? We are told, however, that Botinius was disappointed in his expectation. Six months later, the old Pope, who still lived on, proclaimed the perfect fame of dead Pompilia and forbade the convertite nuns to interfere in any way with her representative in the care of her estate. Next year the Pope died, and the poet adds, If he thought doubt would do the next age good, tis pity he died unapprised what birth his reign may boast of, be remembered by terrible Pope, too, of a kind, Voltaire. This really ends the story. Nothing more can be learned of Gaetano, the son of Guido and Pompilia. All that can be found is a record of a public attestation, which a sister of Guido moved the authorities of Arezzo to give to the right of the Franceschini to men's reverence. This record, in nearly the worst Latin ever writ, declares that, since antique time whereof the memory holds the beginning to this present hour, the Franceschini ever shone, and shine still in the primary rank, supreme amid the lustres of Arezzo, proud to own in this great family the flag-bearer, guide of her steps, and guardian against foe, as in the first beginning, so to-day. One would like to know whether Gaetano, of such perfect parentage, born of love and hate, lived or died, what were his fancies when a man, whether he was like his father or mother? Of all this we know nothing, and the poem ends with these lines. Such then the final state of the story. So did the star Wormwood, in a blazing fall, frighten awhile the waters, and lie lost. So did this old woe fade from memory, till after, in the fullness of the days, I needs must find an ember yet unquenched, and breathing, blow the spark to flame. It lives, if precious be the soul of man to man. So, British public, who may, like me yet, marry and amen, learn one lesson hence, of many, which whatever lives should teach. This lesson, that our human speech is naught, our human testimony false, our fame and human estimation, words and wind. Why take the artistic way to prove so much? Because it is the glory and good of art that art remains the one way possible of speaking truth, to mouths like mine, at least. How look a brother in the face and say, Thy right is wrong, eyes hast thou, yet art blind, thine ears are stuffed and stopped, despite their length, and, oh, the foolishness thou countest faith. Say this as silverly as tongue control. The anger of the man may be endured. The shrug, the disappointed eyes of him are not so bad to bear. But here's the plague, that all this trouble comes of telling truth, which truth, by when it reaches him, looks false, seems to be just the thing it would supplant, nor recognisable by whom it left while falsehood would have done the work of truth. But art, wherein man no wise speaks to men, only to mankind, art may tell a truth obliquely, do the thing shall breed the thought, nor wrong the thought, missing the immediate word. So may you paint your picture, twice show truth, beyond mere imagery on the wall. So, note by note, Bring music from your mind, deeper than ever e'en Beethoven dived. So write a book shall mean beyond the facts, suffice the eye, and save the soul beside. And save the soul. 
if this intent save mine, if the rough oar be rounded to a ring, render all duty which good ring should do, and failing grace succeed in guardianship, might mine but lie outside thine lyric love, thy rare gold ring of verse, the poet praised, linking our England to his Italy. End of chapter 13section fourteen of the ring and the book an interpretation by francis bickford hornbrook this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen lessons of the ring and the book the best way to find the lessons in a poem is not to look for them the worst thing a reader can do is to be constantly asking what does this teach he should pursue the course which students of science have found profitable, first trying to know all they could about the phenomena, and then allowing the total knowledge to make its impression upon them. When the opposite way was pursued, the result was to make nature teach what it was never meant to teach. Progress became possible only when men were willing to learn the actual facts, and to let that knowledge influence them as it would. So we learn the best lessons of history when we are not set upon learning them. I heard a teacher of history, recently, say that we must pay no attention to any historical event unless it taught some moral principle. Nothing could be more vicious. How do we know what the moral significance of events is until we thoroughly know them? And how can we thoroughly know them without careful study of many details which at first sight have no ethical value. If we seek only for the moral precepts, we shall force our moral view into the historic record. We shall become dull moralists and poor historians. Instead of learning from the facts, we shall always be trying to show what facts are morally valuable. The best historian is one who sets before his reader a picture of events as they really happened, and who allows the moral that is in them to reveal itself. Some persons are so absorbed in the moral and spiritual interest of things that their first and almost only interest in a novel or poem is the ethical or religious significance. Browning has suffered much at the hands of such persons. He has been held up as one appointed to give instruction to his age, as one, therefore, to be studied with a view to moral and religious edification. This is one reason why many people do not read Browning who otherwise might read and love him. They do not feel themselves solemn and serious enough for the effort. We read poetry, they say, because we enjoy it. And they are right. Primarily, the poet is not concerned with moral and religious teaching. He is eager, because he is a poet, to give a vivid and interesting picture of some facts in human experience. Browning has done this in The Ring and the Book. In it, he has set forth, in terms of beauty and power, the incidents in the lives of men and women who stood in more or less intimate relations to one another, and he has unfolded to our view the thoughts and feelings which animated them. But I seriously doubt whether he had consciously determined, in it, to deliver any message to his age. He was first a poet, and afterward, and by the way, a teacher. Mr. Burdo, in his Browning Cyclopedia, represents him as an advocate of the orthodox system of theology, as a modern defender of the faith once delivered to the saints. Now, it is probable that personally, Browning was in sympathy with the ideas and beliefs of the Congregationalist Church, which he always attended. This is far more likely than that he was the agnostic which Mrs. Sunderland Orr tries to make him. But, whatever he was, as an individual, he was, in his poetry, neither an agnostic nor an orthodox believer. He was too much a poet for that. He speaks for his characters, not for himself, and it is difficult to find a poem in which we can feel sure that he utters his own conviction. In The Ring and the Book, if we depend upon single expressions, we should be led far out of the way. Mr. Burdo thinks he finds a proof of his belief in the miraculous birth of Christ in the words of Pompilia, who, 
thinking of her child at Christmas time, says, I never realized God's birth before, how he grew likest God in being born. This time I felt like Mary. But this is not an expression of what Browning himself thought, but of what Pompilia, as a good Catholic, must have believed, although before she had not so clearly felt its truth. Mr. Burdo might as well have cited Guido's words at the beginning of Guido's address to the court, in the name of the indivisible trinity, as an evidence of Browning's belief in that conception of the divine nature, when it is only a customary formula. Perhaps the only person in the poem who expresses genuine convictions is the Pope. His estimate of the other characters in the poem is undoubtedly that of the poet himself, and his opinions and reasonings, where they deviate from the authorised views of the Church, must be those of Browning. But where the Pope speaks, as a Catholic must be expected to speak, we can lay no stress upon them as a deliverance of the poet's own conviction. To get the lessons, we must first know the poem as a poem. We must breathe its atmosphere, and then they will come to us without our seeking. Here, it may be said, that Browning himself has given the purpose of the ring and the book in the concluding lines, where he says, So, British public, who may like me yet, marry and are men, learn one lesson hence of many which whatever lives should teach, this lesson, that our human speech is naught, our human testimony false, our fame and human estimation words and wind. It may be that Browning thought, at the conclusion of his poem, that this was one of its important lessons. And so it is. It is a lesson which impresses every attentive reader. One cannot help feeling how hard it is to get at the truth of anything that happens, and how human testimony is moulded in the likeness of our sympathies, our prejudices, and our passions. Things as they appear are often so different from what they are. But, while this is true, I do not believe that Browning began his poem with the conscious purpose of telling this truth obliquely, in the artistic way. Great poems are not written in that manner, and it would not be worth the poet's while to write a poem for such a purpose. That purpose became clear to him as the poem grew, no doubt, but in the same way, other lessons, of which he never dreamed, are suggested to every attentive reader and come by the way as browning transforms the dull facts of the old yellow book into the ring of poetry so we shall be wiser if we read the poem again and again for the pleasure it gives and allow the lessons in it which come to us without our seeking to make their impression upon us but we must always remember that the poem was not written for the sake of the lessons in it but that they are in it as they are in every picture of human experience. To indicate some of the lessons which have been suggested in my own reading, I find first the religious forms and the good life do not necessarily go together. Guido is the wickedest man in the poem. As we have seen, he has hardly any religious faith. At the last, he declares himself to be a primitive religionist, by which he seems to mean one who follows the promptings of his lower nature. He rejoices in this brutal faith, and yet this is the man who never fails to adopt the conventional usage, the pious formula. Caponsacchi, who is a priest and a respectable Catholic, disregards all the usages of the society to which he belongs, and breaks the rules of the church by taking Pompilia in his carriage from Arezzo to Rome. In his address to the court, he uses none of the formal phrases of piety. What he says is dictated by the passion of the moment. But Guido, who believes in just the vile of life, begins his defence with this stereotyped orthodox phrase, and has before that taken minor orders in the church. He clipped his back hair, and so far affected Christ. So far as forms and formulas and professions of pious zeal go, he is the most Christian person in the poem. All this reminds us how little these things may have to do with the real life of a man, 
how little the prevalence of them in a community may reveal of its true character. We learn from the poem how the existence of Christian institutions may go along with the utter absence of the Christian life. Guido's testimony is not always conclusive, but he is certainly correct when he declares that there is not a saintly act done in Rome but might be prompted by the devil. Purest unbelief would do everything that is now being done, as well as the formal belief of the day. All might be heathens, and the appearances of things would remain just the same. A thoroughgoing belief in Christianity would revolutionise the conduct of men. We need not, perhaps, lay much stress on all this, were it not for the fact that it is in perfect accord with the solemn thought of the Pope. He declares, All say good words to who will hear, all do thereby bad deeds to who must undergo. He reviews his Christian world and discovers that its promise has little to do with its performance. The men around him, who are vowed to serve mankind in the light of Christian ideals, neglect Pompilia as men without a ray of Christian light might have neglected her. The archbishop, out of favour to the rank of Guido, throws her back to him again to torture and ruin. The hermit, trained to sacrifice and hardship, promises to write the letter for her, and then, from cowardly fear of the great ones of the place, never does it. The convertite nuns, vowed to the service of fallen women, are as greedy for gain as any of the worldlings. Those who are trained to render the service which Pompilia needed so much never do it, while Caponsacchi, who has no special reason for aiding her, does so not because he is a priest, but because he is a man. What are all these incidents but an evidence that the need of the world is not more institutions of Christianity, but more real Christianity? So the power of Christianity, we learn, is not in its formal acknowledgement in statutes and institutions, but in the influence which it exerts upon the daily life and action of man in society, in business, and in politics. It is a very obvious lesson, many times repeated, but one which needs saying or suggesting many times more. We have also an intimation, in the refusal of Guido to repent, that, to a man who believes in immorality, based upon mere considerations of expediency, repentance is illogical. He very clearly states his idea of the origin of the moral law. It is based, he says, upon the agreement made by the whole world, that certain actions, which gave great pleasure and profit to ourselves, at the expense of others, must be declared illegal. So a man must not kill another, merely because it means pleasure or profit for him to do so. Henceforth, we must get what we wish through law. Whoever violates this compact forfeits his life. He has done this, and he is ready to pay for it. He is willing to submit to the penalty, but, as for repentance, it is nonsense to talk about it. All this shocks us when we first read it. How wicked and unreasonable it all is! We may pass it over as the raving of a madman. But, as we dwell upon it, we begin to realise that if we allow his premises, we cannot fail to allow his conclusions. If a man believes that morality is something immutable in the nature of things, or that it is an expression of the will of God, then, when he has disobeyed its commands, he will condemn himself for opposing what has a claim to his obedience. He will say, I did wrong. Against thee only have I sinned. It will not suffice him to pay the penalty. He must also acknowledge his guilt. But Guido's philosophy of morality recognises no right beyond the agreement made by man to get along safely with, or to protect himself from, his fellow man. He would refrain from the murder of another, not because he sees any sanctity in human life, but because it is not permitted in the social compact, and will expose him to death. Such an one has no use for repentance, or sorrow for sin, or inward compunction. He does not sin, he runs a risk. He does not repent, he pays a penalty. So Guido, and those who think with him, 
commit blunders for which they suffer, but not sins for which they are sorry. All believers in a morality based on expediency must say with him, But, repentance too? But pure and simple sorrow for law's breach, rather than blunderer's ineptitude? Cardinal, no! Abate, scarcely thus. Tis the fault, not that I dared try a fall with law, and straightway am found undermost, but that I failed to see, above man's law, God's precept, you, the Christians, recognize? Collie my cow! Nothing is more common to people in general than the habit of inferring great results from small causes. Something in which, for the time being, we happen to be interested, looms up very large, and we imagine everything must be referred to it. Public speakers, who are aware of this, often find the cause of some event in the prevalence of some notion which has found acceptance but which has been condemned by those in authority. It is a good way to win the attention of the people, and at the same time the approval of those who have favours to confer. An incident in The Ring and the Book shows how this habit of considering the happenings of the day leads one away from the real knowledge of them, and away from their real cause. When the crowd was gathered in the cathedral to view the bodies of Pietro and Violante, placed there near the altar, a cardinal who had been a friend of Guido entered. A young curate thought this a good opportunity for improving the event. Some of the hearers expected to learn more about the causes of the murder, the confession of Pompilia, which had been made that morning, and whether the court had punished anew the gallant Caponsacchi. But not one word of information does our young curate Carlo give, nor one word of real interpretation. He did the murder in a dozen words, and then said that all these outrages were the consequence of the prevalence of Molinism, which he proceeded to discuss and refute. He does this because the cardinal who hears him has written a book on the subject and will be pleased to have his own opinions emphasised. The people think the curate knows what he is about. His business is not to give a right view of the crime that has been committed, but to advance himself. This all seems ridiculous and shameful, but it is what party orators in state and church, editorial writers, and preachers are doing nearly all the time. The real causes of events are ignored and unreal ones magnified. Things are connected which have no sort of relation with one another. Attention is diverted from what is essential to what is purely superficial. Writers, or speakers, gain their personal or political or ecclesiastical ends, perhaps, but their readers or hearers are disappointed or misled. Some momentary gain, not truth, is their object. All this finds artistic reprobation in the account of Curate Carlo's discourse and its effect. He spoke over two centuries ago, and he has long since vanished from the earth, but those who follow his example, alas, are only too many. We learn from other incidents in the poem how unfairly motives are judged. Caponsacchi, as we know, acted from the purest motive, the desire to save a woman from suffering and death. To get her to her parents in Rome, he took her in a carriage and drove without pausing until Pompilia's strength failed her at Castelnuovo. And yet nearly all give his act the worst possible construction. The rabble, of course, take it for granted that he had only an evil intention in his heart. The superior social set in Rome regard him as an offender against the honour of Guido, as one who was gently dealt with, not because he was innocent, but because he was a priest, and therefore favoured by the priests who tried him. Even the judges of the court did not altogether believe his account of his motives. They smiled judicially as he told his story, and shrugged their shoulders, as if to say, The sly one, all this we are bound to believe. Well, he can say no other than what he says. We have been young too. Come, there's greater guilt. Let him but decently disembroil himself, scramble from out the scrape, nor move the mud. We solid ones may risk a finger-stretch. It is not until Pompilia and the Pope 
speak that we see him in the light of his best motive and understand him as he really is. Pompilia reveals how his course was throughout purity in quintessence, one dewdrop, and calls him her soldier saint. The Pope sees in him one who deserved the rose of gold, one who did the work in obedience to his heroic impulse which those who were appointed to do it failed to do. Surely here we are taught that there is a difference in minds, a difference in eyes that see the minds. The motives imputed in every case reveal the nature of the person who imputes them. To the mean, all motives appear mean. To the commonplace, all motives are commonplace. These are not able to conceive motives that are noble and unusual. Even the shrewd men who know the world know it so well that they never suspect there may be men in it who act on motives that are not worldly. It is only the pure soul of Pompilia, ermine-like, armed from dishonour by its own soft snow, and the Pope, sensible of fires that more and more visit a soul in passage to the sky, who divine the motive of Caponsacchi and give it due honour and praise. The way in which those about him judge the motives of the Pope himself in condemning Guido to death shows again how we suppose others to be swayed by the motives that move ourselves, and therefore how unjust such judgments may be, and often are. We know with what solemn seriousness the Pope decided upon the case of Guido. We know he thought and acted as a man who is conscious that God is viewing every movement of his soul. He judges as one who is willing to be judged by his last judgment. But the outside world knows nothing of all this. It assumes that he determined the execution of Guido because he wished to screen a scandal of the church, or because he was old and liked to have younger men die before himself, or because he hated Austria and had a passion for France. These fairly got the better in the man of justice, prudence, and esprit de corps, and he persisted in the butchery. All this may shame us when we remember what reasons we have asserted for the judgments of those of whom we know as little as the people on the streets of Rome knew of the nature of the aged Pope. It is a reminder to us that the motives that usually impel men to act may have nothing to do with the action we are ready to condemn. So far I have noticed only the incidental lessons of the ring and the book. That is, lessons that suggest themselves in particular passages of the poem. I now wish to call attention to some of the lessons that are implied in its total spirit. One of these is the necessity of a basis for our judgments. The representative characters in Half Rome and The Other Half Rome and Tertium Quid readily utter their opinions of the parties involved in the celebrated murder case. They easily decide in favour of husband or wife or regard both as unworthy of a special praise or blame. But these never take any evident pains to know why they judge as they do. They are satisfied with the conclusion to which their experience of life, or their feelings, or their class prejudices inevitably lead them. They feel the need of nothing more final than these. In this they are very much like all of us. Every day we express opinions which have nothing to rest upon except our personal bias or the conventional code of conduct and belief. As for the actors in the poem, Guido, Caponsacchi and Pompilia, they are too much occupied with the statement of the case as it seems to them to think of anything else. Guido is satisfied if he can make his act appear to the judges justifiable in the light of legality and custom. Whether the law or custom rested on a sentiment of real righteousness, or not, does not concern him. Pompilia unfolds the experience through which he has passed and expresses the emotions which that experience aroused. Caponsacchi makes it clear to the court that his version of events is the true one. As for the lawyers, they think of nothing else than the flourish of their legal subtleties. Perhaps from these, no more ought to be expected. But when we come to the Pope, we have a very different way of regarding the whole matter. He solemnly reviews the case and passes his judgment upon all the characters involved in it. He is thoroughly persuaded 
that he knows them all just as they are. Nothing can be more decided than his tone. We seem to hear in it not so much the voice of a man as the expression of the law of right. And here we might ordinarily expect him to end. Why does he go on? And why does he delay to sentence Guido and his companions? It is not because he is irresolute, not because he may, by some possibility, be mistaken. He declares that his purpose is fixed, and he does not stand on the infallibility of his knowledge, but upon the integrity of his motive. But he still ponders, because he is conscious of a quick, cold thrill, which reminds him that his judgment cannot ultimately rest upon his clear-sightedness, which the habit of a lifetime has made keen, but upon the validity of his conception of the universe. A voice seems to say to him, Look round thee for the light of the upper sky. He is thus admonished to consider the postulates which must underlie every decision he makes. He is compelled to ask himself upon what grounds his ordinary beliefs depend and to face the doubts, and to give answer to the questionings of his soul. It may seem strange and unreasonable for the Pope to pursue this course, and in ordinary actual procedure it would be so. If every time we pronounce a decision upon the conduct and character of those about us, or if every time a judge passed sentence upon a criminal, he paused to meditate until he was able to vindicate his ultimate view of things, there would be little time for anything else. Life would be all speculation, and action would be paralysed. It is probable that the actual Pope, Innocent the Twelfth, very properly did not, after he had examined the papers, delay ten minutes to record his conclusion. But in the poem we have an ideal Pope, who is judging in an ideal way, and the way in which he seeks to find solid foundations for his decision impresses us with the lesson which we ought to heed, namely, that every decision we make depends for its character upon our real conviction with regard to God and nature and man and their relations to one another. Here Browning gives an unconscious refutation of the notion which often finds utterance in these times, that it makes no difference what we believe as far as practical life goes. This is true as far as mere superficial and conventional beliefs go. But the real belief of a man determines the character of all that he does and says. It is the most real thing in him. And so it is of the utmost importance that a man should know that his belief is capable of justification in view of his deepest thought. Another lesson which comes to us in the reading of the poem is that it is the little, almost unnoticed, things by which we are tested. This appears in the relation of the different characters to Pompilia. We are so impressed by the Pope's representation of her essential worth and beauty of soul, and by her own revelation of herself in all her sweetness and purity, that we are apt to lose sight of the fact that she did not appear to those who saw her from day to day perfect in whiteness. We are much like the artist Maratta, who came to her bedside to sketch her face, exclaiming, A lovelier face is not in Rome. Whereupon another remarks, Mighty fine, but nobody cared ask to paint the same, nor grew a poet over hair and eyes four little years ago. The genius of a great poet has taught us to love and admire her, but those about her saw a girl of only seventeen, she was a strange young girl in Arezzo, who had been deserted, and then disowned by her supposed parents. She was surrounded by those who hated her, and sought her ruin. She had no friends, and she was ignorant of the world, and of books. Of all the people in the city, she seemed of least consequence. But she served to test the lives of those to whom she appealed in her misery for help. The governor pushed her back to her husband, with a shrug and smile. The archbishop only scolded her and gave her unfitting advice. The hermit promised to write to her parents after he had heard her piteous story, and never did. To them she seemed only an annoyance. They knew that their lives must be tested, but they never dreamed it would be 
by their treatment of this poor unfriended girl one thought it would be in some great emergency of the state another in some demand of the church and still another in some great act of sacrifice but in fact the test came when it was never expected and they are judged only by reference to that all that we know of them now is that they knew her and neglected her she needed them and they turned away if they had only known all that she was and all that she has become they would have done otherwise but as with all of us the crisis came when they were not aware of it in unsuspected guise from that hour when they turned her away with indifference and scorn and idle jest they began to sink lower in the scale of being and they lost the opportunity of their lives but pompilia turned to caponsacchi and he recognized her great need and responded to it and sacrificed all his hope of the future to it it mattered not to him that the appeal came in the form of one who had little to commend her to his attention it was enough for him that when god's command spoke through this insignificant woman he readily obeyed through his obedience he rose into a new form of life where the very immolation made the bliss in his short contact with her he learned the lessons which theological formulas and ecclesiastical institutions had never impressed upon him so that at last he cries unmindful of all misapprehending ignorance i assuredly did bow was blessed by the revelation of pompilia the blessing which others missed because it offered itself in such humble guise was found by caponsacchi he was enabled to realize the profoundest revelations of god to the soul of man and to win the homage of all who prize moral courage and self-sacrifice because he did not turn aside from the humble woman who sought his aid in her extremity connected with this is still another teaching of the ring and the book we are apt to imagine that the revelation of god comes to us in the unusual and the striking surely we think he will make himself known to us in some mountain amid thunders and smoke and fire his word will come to us we imagine in some book weighty with thought or in a magnificent ceremonial of the church or from the lips of some eloquent divine it has come in this way to many it may come so to many more but in the ring and the book we learn that the choicest revelations of the spirit come not alone in the main current of the general life but small experiences of every day concerns of the particular hearth and home and that we learn not only by a comet's rush but a rose's birth the poet does not seek to instruct us through an account of heroic men and women engaged in the mighty struggle in a far-off time he tells us of a time not far away of an episode of only local and momentary importance the characters conceived have nothing extraordinary about them the pope good and noble as he is is not one of the great popes of the church the people concerned in the story pass through no wonderful experiences and yet the poet reveals through them as much wisdom of life as if he concerned himself with heroic figures and world-famed deeds character is disclosed in the talk of the street and the chatter of the drawing-room no devil reveals the malignity of evil but guido in the unfolding of the thoughts and feelings of his secret soul helps us to understand something of the abysmal depths of evil in the human heart pompilia is a poor ignorant girl but through her short life and humble experience we learn how the character of an angel is formed caponsacchi does comparatively little but in what he does we learn what true manliness is and how the nature is developed through obedience to the divine command the pope has only a decision to make but in making it he causes us to see how solemn a thing a decision is and upon what deep foundation it rests pompilia and caponsacchi are together for three days and most of that time is passed in the flight from arezzo to rome and the words spoken are few and simple yet these come to constitute caponsacchi's real religion 
and thus we are taught that all that is needed for the most effective revelation is the contact of a pure nature with a receptive soul. End of chapter 14 End of The Ring and the Book An Interpretation by Francis Bickford Hornbrook Read by Algie Pug